Ähm, eine kleine Bitte, ich glaube, ihr wisst es, ne? das sind alles mit den Prints, einfach da so ein bisschen vorsichtig sein, dass ihr da nicht rankommt. Ähm, der Talk heute Abend von Rosa Menkmann, Rebecca äh, Kissier weiter, wird sie gleich noch vorstellen, ist Teil von dem Workshop, der hier diese Woche stattfindet. Und wir hatten heute den ersten Tag. Und zwar heißt der Workshop Template Culture Inclus <lacht> Inklusion, Neutralität und gestaltliche Verantwortung. So ist es. <lacht> und es ist ein einwöchiger geschlossener Workshop mit Studenten von der FH Potsdam und Studenten vom Hyperwerk in Basel. Und wir eben. Es geht um, um diese Templates, was sind Templates, was sind sie nicht, wie gehen wir damit um und wie können wir damit heute auch äh, verantwortungsvoll oder was sie auch kulturell bedeuten etc. Das wird jetzt alles diese Woche erörtert und erarbeitet. Und wir haben, wir, das sind in dem Fall äh, Franziska Maunock von der FA Potsdam, <lacht> Rebecca Kieselwetter und ich, die wir beide auch mit dem Hyperwerk in Basel, äh, wo wir beide auch unterrichten, und ähm, genau, das ist jetzt, hatten wir jetzt die Möglichkeit, auch noch zwei Referenten einzuladen. Die erste ist eben heute Abend Rosa Menkmann und morgen kommt Anja Kaiser, die beide also auch zu diesem Thema Template im weitesten Sinne eben ihre Beiträge liefern. Und herzlich willkommen und ich gebe einfach weiter an Rebecca, die noch ein paar Oh, yes, actually I really will make it super short mm -hmm. and I switch to English because also um, Rosa's presentation will be in English and I think not everybody is super fluent in um, German. Um, today we've been working already on templates that we define as like some default um, settings that on one hand order bring into relation make a lot of things easier, simplify. Um, but there are also kind of mechanisms to black box, to um, exclude, to validate or disqualify, etc. So it's like really um, those biases and those problematics were, um, behind templates, but um, we also working around. And that's also why we invited um, Rosa Minkman. And we today already had a conversation on and how for biographies or those, let's say, formal ways to introduce persons are also kind of templates that somehow sometimes fit, because you just can say I'm a graphic designer or an artist or um, and there isn't any of those templates that really applies to Rosa. So I'd say probably try trying to mix up some of those um, templates. She's an artist, a researcher, a theorist, a curator, um, a professor of the um, Hochschule für Gestaltung Kassel. And here I'm citing Rosa herself. Her work focuses on noise artifacts that result from accidents in both analog and digital media such as glitch and encoding and feedback artifacts. Um, Rosa believes that these artifacts can facilitate an important insight into the otherwise obscure alchemy of standardization via resolutions. Um, the standardization of resolutions is a process that generally imposes efficiency, order and functionality on our technologies. It does not just involve the creation of protocols and solutions, but also entails the obfuscation of compromises and black boxing of alternative possibilities, which are, as a result, in danger of staying forever unseen or even forgotten. And I think that a part of uh, Rosa's talk um, tonight also will um, evolve around those um, lost, forgotten, shady um, ghosts that we 
for the youth. Um, but uh, so I get to turn it over to you. And thanks a lot for being here with us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anja and Rebecca and Francisca, for, <laughs> um, for having me in this very nice space. Um, this is my website. A lot of the research that I do, I post it here. Uh, I am also a professor in media at the Caracas, so all the stuff that I teach, I, I always try to push it on here. Um, just a question to begin with, because I know you guys got like, um, like kind of the homework, some of you, so those that are in the class, uh, to read behind white shadows or to look at it. Who, who read the text? Not to know, that's, that's, lovely, that's quite fine. But then I know uh, that, that it's not super double, otherwise, you know, that I would race over it, but I have like enough stuff to. We're gonna go fast anyway. Um, but a lot of my work has been kind of like basing on the work that I've done in the past, so it's like an ongoing kind of research. That's also why I call myself a researcher. Um, so in the beginning, I was just interested in materiality, the digital materiality, right? So I'm thinking in file structures. This, for instance, is um, me opening an image. The image is called this Tito JPEG. So it's JPEG image. Opening it up in hex code uh, viewer. If you watch something in Hexcode, you don't see the image, you see the data of the image. So you see the image data, you can write something, and that, that, that data will be read, uh, in, or is implemented in the data of the file, and so you can kind of read, write images if you don't break the codec. So from this I started to learn to make glitches. Glitches is basically just breaks in any kind of file, um, and then kind of like, Putting the aesthetic of the file from up to the front. Um, this is one of my favorite researchers. His name is B. Um, there it goes to the art. Um, so, B. he wrote a string of data and he gave a program. The program is take any object and wrap the data around the object and make a drawing from it. So you imagine this is kind of about the fluidity of what data can be. You don't always have to watch the JPEG uh, in a, a JPEG viewer. You can also uh, listen to it. So this is something I call the fluidity of data, or rheology of data. Rheology is kind of a term that, is, that I, I, I steal from uh, um, what do you call this? Uh, it's leaky, it's unstable. Um, and so I'm trying to play with how, how any kind of data can be heard, it can be seen, it can be um, displayed in uh, HTML code or whatever. So there's this like kind of much more fluid understanding of data than how we're trained to use it via machines. So how machines normally resolve it. And from that I started to write, and this is really quite old, it's the um, vernacular of file formats. I tried to, under, to explain how particular file formats are used with particular, uh, how do you say, politics, rules of how to use them. Um, so, for instance, if you break Photoshop RAW, you get this aesthetic. A bitmap image, this is like from the 80s already, so quite old. The glitches are very different. GIFs, also from the 80s. I do every time very similar breaks, but the aesthetics, if you can see it, like sometimes it's like per line the break, sometimes the colors break, sometimes blocks break, etc. I was just trying to explain how these file formats react different to glitching and why that is. It's because these file formats are produced to exist, to be used within a particular environment. So for instance, the JPEG is for compressing data online and sending it fast, so it cuts away a lot, so it blocks are big blocks. If you have a bitmap, it saves it per pixel. So the glitches are very different. You, you glitch something in JPEG, you glitch a whole block, you glitch something in a bitmap, you just glitch a few pixels. So that was the vernacular of file formats. And I did everything, this is 2009, I did it on my face. This is my face, but quite wrong. <laughs> Uh, and that was interesting. I was not the only person that did it, so um, there was this whole environment that made this kind of jokes. 
Nick Breeze, uh, Kim Asendorf, who also made new file formats. So you can imagine that if you're an artist or a designer, you don't always want to use just the compressions that are standardized, because for instance, JPEGs, they make you cut away particular parts of your file. So MP3 does the same, right? If you have like high and low frequency changes, then if you compress it to an MP3, you cut this kind of data, this kind of sounds away, because you cannot really hear it, but you can, but you cannot. So it says the, the, the compression designer. So JPEG does the same. As a designer, you don't really want to do this. Um, but you, you don't always kind of control what is being cut away. And for this, new compression, such as extra files, uh, made. So I was invited to uh, kind of show this and the possibilities that extra file would offer us new compressions for artists that want to own their own compression. And I made this file. So from the same image but now with a new compression. This is not a normal compression so not all computers could read this image file because they don't have the codec to uh, decode the image file compression. Um, but if I glitch it, then a new kind of organization of data comes to the front. So far, you can kind of follow it, I hope. So the point of this is all, this is a new image, this kind of structure didn't really exist before uh, Kim Asendorf offered it to the world, and this is my face. <laughs> and this is my face. But that's not me, love letter. Uh, and this is my face. And then it started to have all kinds of lives, my face. It started to get a bit weird. Uh, young Joey, uh, who I don't know, um, is a, a black rapper with his face on my face. <laughs> and uh, Francisco Otero started to sell my face. The <laughs> glitch um, image app for your phone started to... I don't know, like their, their, their application icon had my face. But that, they could not make it because they don't have this file format in the phone. But it was very strange. So, commercial applications use my face. Uh, posters for Hollywood movies started to use my face. <laughs> so what's, I mean, you know, this cannot be just a, This is something. So, uh, actually, at re, re, uh, was it Resonate? I was asked by Nora and by Bogomir to talk about this. Like what does it mean to lose your face like that? Like to kind of lose the control where your face starts to spread through the world. And then I thought, it cannot be new. We all know that this happens to people. I mean, the internet is there. But how can I contextualize this? So I started to do research. And of course, uh, anybody these days that does research finds Peter Steidel because she does research on all the important stuff. It's like Donna Haraway but for new media. Or not really because Donna Haraway is also new media. But it's like these names that today are everywhere and every time. So if you don't mention that, it's like 10 years ago it was like they have to cope and now they have... That was a joke. <laughs> it's a good joke. <laughs> it's true though, so I had to make the disclaimer. Um, so she uh, uh, has this talk, it's called White Shadows. It's the White Shadows of Image Processing. And in this talk she describes uh, how 3D um, kind of taking of photos or uh, of crime scenes, actually scanning the crime scene would give more reality to uh, the forensic evidence. However, she also describes how this actually is just still the capturing of a perspective. Somebody has to hold the 3D camera and chooses where, from where it's scanned. And from where it's scanned, I don't scan this. So it's just two and a half D. You know, if you have ever used a 3D scanner, that points kind of like a laser, it just gives you a point cloud, then you still see just this side of where you were standing. So you might think it gives you more reality, but in fact, it's still the person that holds the technology that decides what you see and what you scan. Mm -hmm. So this whole like idea of the perfect new forensic evidence of 3D scanning was kind of like dismissed. So in White Shadows, she's saying like, what is missing from images? What is missing is what the person that created the the technology didn't implement in a technology. And we need to learn to look at what is not implemented. And I think it's very important. Um, so from that I ran into research by uh, Lorna Wolf. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. If not, then you should watch the first two minutes because this is an amazing video and the rest you can watch on YouTube because it's on YouTube. This is a Shirley Dart. 
So Kodak Gold is known to be the first um, color uh, ref, uh, um, how do you say, like, um, film that was also tested for dark horses. And this was the commercial with which they showed that. But the tagline was works for dark horses. Uh, and chocolate. This was their first um, multiracial, they called it a Shuri test card. So this is the first card that actually features other races and other colors in that sense. Um, okay, so that's it for uh, analog photography, but uh, as uh, if you watch the Lorna Roth video, you will see already that there is something uh, similar happening in any kind of technology that is developed after, so also digital technologies. This is Lena. Lena was the Playboy Centerfold from 1972. As you can see here, not so well, she is naked. Um, she was 512 by 512 pixels, but she's the only color test card, or test card even, for the JPEG compression. JPEG compression is still the most used compression today. Only ever tested to work properly on Lena. Quite painful, if I can tell you that. Um, so uh, the beauty of this, the, 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 the worst I mean, we say, I said, I mean, the worst example of it is even that uh, I found some beautiful quotes by Jeff Seidemann, one of the, um, the producers of this compression. Uh, he said, when you use a picture like that for so long, because they had to test a lot, JPEG was like very, very tested. At some point, the image that they tested on doesn't become a person anymore. They lose their identity, they're just an image. So they had stolen this image actually from uh, Playboy. The story is that one day somebody just walked into the image processing test lab and they were just kind of bored with testing their images on the tea kettle because that was like a normal standard thing to do. And then they were like, okay, let's see what's for centerfold this month. And they ripped it out, scanned it in with their Moorhead, their self-edited Moorhead uh, image uh, scanner. And uh, accidentally they lost one line, so she's a little bit thinner, but that's okay. And um, they used her because she's just so nice and glossy and, you know, nice for the eyes. Um, oh, this is actually that story, but anyway. Um, so there she is, still can see her, but she's naked. Um, so the conclusion there is, um, this is not this is not something that is um, just for analog or for digital. It's an ongoing thing. Uh, one of the main points of the talk will be refuse to let the syntaxes of history break our futures. Uh, I like this quote. We could be fine tuning our algorithms, our approaches to this one image. They will do great on that one image, but will they do well on anything else? And that's actually the question. If you just test something on Lena, will it test well, or will it work on something else? That's never really been tested with JPEG. Um, if I still, if I go through the archives of all the JPEG um, papers that have been written there, hundreds, it's always her. I have like many, many examples. And I wonder what would have happened if they would have used Janet Jackson, for instance. Janet Jackson, sorry. Uh, who was the centerfold, the first uh, African-American uh, Playboy centerfold in 1965, or maybe better, not a naked lady, Christine Darden, who is a researcher at uh, NASA. Or they could just have used a guy or a horse, who knows, but anyway, they didn't. This is not something that is just from the 1970s, it's still ongoing, and here's a talk from Zach Glass, it's a beautiful lecture, you can watch it online, it's uh, done in Sonic Acts in 2017, where he explains that even today a lot of skin recognition, facial recognition softwares don't recognize people of color, specifically black people. They will recognize uh, the woman with the boobs on the t-shirt of the guy, but not the guy's face. It's too dark, in the darkness. Actually, in my screen it's very, it's very visible, it's just that here it's not enough light now to reflect. Um, this is another beautiful example, it's a um, uh, Nikon that has facial recognition but also the recognition to see if somebody blinks, anti-blink technology, uh, never tested on Asian people, so apparently Asian people uh, blink a little bit more often. Um, and one student 
uh, Ekokan uh, Luo. She did her research on uh, 3D scanning technologies. So she is a Chinese, which means that her face has a very different bone structure. You have softwares that if you um, just put a photo on a, a model, you can make a 3D model of it, but because uh, this is made by Caucasian people, the bone structure is always from Caucasian people. So if you're Chinese or if you're a person of color, a black person, you'll have different bone structure and the face will never be mapped properly. It will always look like you're completely, I don't know, like not how you look, let's say, like droopy, weird eyes that are not properly mapped. And it's not possible. So a lot of software still today don't offer the option for you to use it proper. I think I'll skip this if you're more interested in more examples. This is Jennifer from Paradise, an artwork by uh, Constant Dullard, who was uh, criticizing this kind of uh, uses of white women uh, and the objectification of the white body, which leaves uh, all kinds of problems. And from this, I uh, created my own exhibition, which was called Behind White Shadows, which was inspired by Judith Stiles' uh, talk. And it had also a cabinet of all these colored test cards. Um, just her quote, what becomes visible on the back of the image is the space that is not captured, the space that is missing, the missing data, the space where an object covers the view. Who decides the point of view and who stands behind the perspective from which any scanning or any image technology is operated? Who is casting the shadow? This is something we really need to learn to ask with any kind of technology every day. Because we're just building and building and building technology upon technology, also known as black boxing or putting protocols inside of protocols. And we be these we become completely obfuscated, obscure, um, to these kind of uh, problems. So I created a, a patch because every, this is kind of for me, it's like my war against image processing. Every war needs a patch. Uh, so this is the patch to go to war to show that you're from the right side of the war against all these like wrong protocols. And I got the chance, this is from uh, Vogue, you know, <laughs> no, the other Vogue, Vogue magazine. They asked me to show, uh, to put the image with their weird thing, uh, it was a beauty, it was about what uh, does UV light do to your skin. But I thought it was kind of like, okay, they want to use my image, then let's do something, let's give it a new name. No longer vernacular file formats, it's called a color test card for image decalibration. We need to do something against this like normal calibration, let's do something, I will rename it as an act of war, in Vogue. Don't think ever, anybody ever got it, but that's fine, it was there. Um, but then, you know, I'm an artist, I want to do something with this, but what can I do? That is not so easy. You know, now I've written this paper, you could have read it, you can still read it. But I want to do something more, and then I get like in kind of like a little bit of trouble, because there's actually quite some works and some things that I could reference, and, it's, and then actually when you do research, it becomes really hard because at some point you know too much to really make something. I don't know if you've realized, if, if you've experienced that, but you can't do too, so there is something that's too much research. And then, how, how to put it all together, I don't know. So, I'm starting to look into what all these images that become standardized mean. And I started to thinking, what are like these like weird people that have lost their personality or their name or never had a name to begin with? So I found a few from social media. We have, everybody recognizes Tom, right? Or maybe not. Maybe you're Tom from MySpace. Like that was your first friend if you had your MySpace account. You're that like your stable friend. He was always there. In the Netherlands, we had like this guy for our social network. That was Hypes. It was like also my best friend. No, but I mean, you know, this, and it's funny because these are men. Your first friends are your buddies, and clearly they're men or clippies or whatever. Maybe I'm pushing it too, too much to the gender thing, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting that these are not women, they're men. Uh, if you park a domain, or no, if you want to buy a domain that is parked, here is Park Domain Girl. Does anybody recognize her? She used to be um, 
in every uh, domain that was kind of lost, that used to be, for instance, a domain or that will probably be sold, she was sit standing there, like <laughs> something like this. She was like a stock photo, right? So there was one day that actually I looked up who she was, because she is a person also. She's not just part of maker. Uh, she's <laughs> Hannah, Hannah Seller, and this photo was taken by her brother and then sold to iStock. And then the park domain uh, company bought it for a few cents and now used it since then on every domain. And it's like thousands, you always saw her. And you, you recognize her. Does anybody else recognize her? That's too old then, because she was everywhere. I wasn't the only one that knows about her. Parker Ito did a lot of research. He's a digital artist from California. He made a lot of works about her, like inspired by morphing her face, which I don't know if I think I got like. I liked the work by Constant because he was very critical and was asking questions. But here now we start to go into the territory of just taking these faces. And I don't know if this is like a love letter or it's just weird. Like morphing the face because it was already so overused. This is like a website, uh, it's called Park Domain Girl Tombstone. No, couldn't find the maker, but you find the website. Does anybody recognize Ariana? She is still happening, but you have to pay attention. She is like um, <laughs> the most used stock photo out there. And she, she and her boyfriend or husband or whatever it is, she doesn't give her name. I had to really search for her name. There is thousands of ads with her. She's like the most, it's, it's, it's probably because she's Canadian, but Asian, everything in between. So she can speak to a huge crowd. And uh, she, she is the, the, the image of everything, like Google and I don't know, healthiness and flying and all this stuff. Salad eating for the first, uh, I, the first researcher. And have you ever researched salad eating? Because that's what you get, salad eating girl. Mm -hmm. She's in there quite a few times. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. I also found this other thing, the render ghosts. This is a research by James Bridle. It's beautiful. It's about um, architectural renderings. If you render, if, for instance, if you walk through London, there's like huge places where it's just broken up because they're going to build something. But before it's built, they want to show that there's actually something happening that's worthwhile. So they'll put some renders up and they don't put the renders without people because then it would look like a, a dead place and that's scary. So they put random people in. And James Bridle's question is, who are these people that are in these renders, right? So he started to make a research trying to find where these images come from because it's also very specific people. Very often it's not black people, uh, a lot of white women drinking coffee or whatever. It's like weird kind of uh, folk. Do they know they're in these renders? Were they asked or are they just stolen? The photos are often very strangely lit so they don't look so professional. But so if you want to know the, the end of that story, you can find it. It's beautiful. Or I like it a lot. Um, I like these ones also. Have you ever met one of those? The tense, tense theater girls? They're like there at like um, train stations and air, air, airports in the US, a lot of them. They come and they tell you what to do. Put your stuff in the train. Oh, they don't really move. They just move inside their little cut I don't know. So, um, start to look who they are. Apparently, there's a company that makes them all. They're also all women. They're also all white. And they have names such as Carla, Paige, Holly, and Libby. I thought that was kind of uh, strange. Let's say it's strange. So what is all of this? How to make sense of it? I mean, I'm just in process. I'm just showing you what I'm trying to do. I think it's some kind of like new form of ventriloquism. You know, ventriloquism is like you sit there and you have your sock puppet and you're talking to your tummy, but the puppet then. It's like puppeteering of the white woman talking to their audience or being the test card or whatever. It's very strange. Oh yeah, this is a horse you can say. Oh, um, I think that ventriloquism slide was too early, but it doesn't matter. Here's just a few more examples. So you all know they became racist. Right? It was like the, the Microsoft AI that 
started to talk to people. This is a work by Zach Glass again. Um, he animates tape. She comes back from the dead and starts to talk about how it mean, what it means to be uh, put to sleep, she calls it. She went to deep dream. Um, but it's strange because he now animates her with a weird 3D mask and she has a particular voice in which she kind of talks about her experience and I just wonder if that's really what Tay would say. I don't know, because Tay is in deep dream. Is it, is it went to sleep, Microsoft killed her. Um, I am this is Hita Stiles. Uh, she made a research about spam people. I wanted to mention this one too. I like this one because this is actually uh, it's a bit out there and maybe has nothing to do with everything, but it's kind of also a beautiful, uh, funny joke what spam could be. This is like the first message to the aliens. <laughs> do, uh, do you guys remember the golden uh, plate that was sent, the golden records? that was sent to space so that any other intelligence can get to know about how uh, human culture is. Casper um, is one of my students, he's like, oh, this is like the first spam for out of space, for the aliens. <laughs> um, so all this stuff, uh, I was trying to put this together also for your course, let's say, all the banners that we now have that are standardized in this way, advertising, they're all still templated. All banners follow standard forms. You can buy a banner, it's like a new form of advertising, right? You no longer um, just put something uh, as an advertisement uh, on a website statically. No, you can buy a banner and then it goes and it's like a focus on the person, on the profiles that are logging into that website. You can personalized content, but all the personalized content is always within a particular form. Just so you know that banners just have something like five or four different shapes and that's that's the as, as, as adventurous as it goes in advertisement. Advertisements make culture. Chocolate made uh, Kodak make image processing develop. Now this is like the sizes in which we are making our advertisements. Oh, okay, this is like the standard size, you can just look it up, but I thought it was quite funny. Um, this is a work by um, Constant Dullard. He is uh, making a fake army of fake profiles um, to kind of play with this kind of uh, advertisements and also the power of uh, your personal profile. Look it up if you're interested. I put a lot of slides, so I'm going way too fast, but if you have a question, you can come back or you can look it up or whatever. Um, yeah, so I wanted to make kind of a switch and I don't know if it will work really well, but I'm going to try. It's like me trying to be poetical, but it's hard. Um, this is like, uh, I just really like Casper David Friedrich because uh, I was brought up with Casper David Friedrich. My brother was named after him, so we had to understand what that actually meant. So, obviously. Uh, Friedrich rarely painted daylight or any form of light as it shines during a clear day. Instead, he used the cover of night, sunset, and sunrise, or mist and fog, to make light shine more mysteriously. You can use the fog or mist allegory, like uh, how would you translate that? Like, uh, example or um, uh, not metaphor, but something like this, when trying to deconstruct the now universal standards of identification and of capability. So talking about uh, targeted advertisements. The more I am present, the more I am. If I wish to be less me, less targetable, I need to withdraw from recognition. I need to learn to become a part. In contemporary folk, we can follow tactics like erasing, deleting, disappearing. Folk is an instrumental apparatus. It offers varying degrees of visibility, clarity, obscurity. Folk makes revolt possible. I think I made five steps in one slide. The point is that if you want to kind of get away from this targeted advertising and all these like weird ghosts that haunt us all the time, that are supposed to be like talking to us, then we need to kind of become less us. But also there's this very, so this is where I'm still in the research and where things become rather vague maybe, but there's this like, 
weird thing between the ghosts that have no name and then talking to us that have name and then we if we become more like a ghost then they will talk be able to less targetly talk to us do you kind of understand what i mean weird okay um this is a video uh Here, 
everything falls, but Kodak. Because Kodak is... <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's funny, but um, it says something about uh, screens. Uh, here's my collection of interesting... These are the hackers. The hackers, they, they put their data in 3D, right? This is uh, an interface for a space computer. Very complicated. Um, Movies for children are amazing because they feature round interfaces. We don't have all, all screens still are kind of quadrilateral. Actually not all because now we have iPhones and they have mooches. But all the children's movies, they, they already feature interesting interfaces. Here this is uh, Expanse, it's like a sci-fi uh, television show. And here you have this like weird non-quadrilateral interface that starts to expand. Uh, this is the Kingsman. His umbrella is like a screen with which he can like kind of protect himself from weird data from the, 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 the guy that is fighting him. Minority Report, we all know, I realized that all the sci-fi movies that do holograms are all in blue, right? All holograms and all sci-fi screens use kind of blue. So I did a lot of this research, I'll go through it really fast. Turns out that there is actually something happening. All these screens, they all give us standards. Ghosts, they still talk through analog noise. There is hardly any movie in which if a ghost comes into the frame, they will use digital glitches. They will use analog. If uh, an alien comes, the alien will very often produce line interference because it cannot be too complex. We have to win from the aliens, so it's like just lines. Um, if it's about artificial intelligence, there will be blocks involved. If it's a hacker, it will be lines of data in green and black. Still, even though hackers no longer use monochrome screens, that's but uh, if uh, we're being tracked, then we have always all these like weird interface references. There's a lot of language, a lot of like standardized. Uh, template references on how to visualize these sci-fi tropes. And the question is, is that because sci-fi movies in Hollywood is following technological developments in Silicon Valley, and actually that's California versus uh, San Francisco uh, versus LA, which is like, what, like nine hours drive? Or if it's um, uh, Silicon Valley versus Hollywood, or vice versa, I don't know what I said first. So who's following who, who is inspired, or is it just like, are they just mutually talking? And they are, they actually talk a lot. Um, so I came across this Christopher Nussel talk. He actually did a lot of uh, design uh, for sci-fi and uh, also for interface design. And then he explained, <coughs> for instance, uh, that Blue tungsten light is just uh, easily used because you can uh, make the colors come back again easily. This is like... Okay, so I have a lot more slides because I uh, was very generous in thinking how to present all my uh, interesting... What am I going to do with all this? Right, so I think it started with this. This is like... I, I realized that all these people, all these ghosts that I've collected, they all exist within the computer. So I cannot just put them outside of the computer, because that's not where they live. So whatever I'm going to do with them, they have to exist within the computer. So then how can I make the ghosts that have no name talk about their experience of losing your name, of being tested upon, etc. Without them really having a voice, like I could do it like Sekulas does, and give they a new voice, but it's kind of I found that kind of not right. I don't want to give a voice to Shirley or to you know like put and, and because if I do it, what voice should I do? Should I do my own voice? I have a very Dutch voice with a very Dutch inflection. Should I give like uh, the voice of uh, I don't know Siri? that would also uh, impose like an Apple reference or whatever. So it's like, it, that's kind of fragile. So I don't want to just put one reference on the next. So thinking that templates always give references and ways of reading, right? So uh, I first started like this. This is a like kind of um, um, 
a weird, weird environment in which I wanted to make particular uh, people talk. So I thought maybe it's possible to do it via like a text message, like a text message, but actually text message is like quite new, 15 years old, so surely probably didn't have a cell phone from the future to talk to. So I, I, I think this will not work for surely. So then I thought, okay, I will need to make an environment that is different. So right now my environment is this, but at home my environment is like a higher resolution, so they have, they are like more organized. Now I'm a projector, they have smash it together. But so in my my in my environment, my environment is organized. So um, you can see it's like my collection of ghosts. Um, and then I can make them talk. Let's see, like this is just clear ladies. Where, where's Lily? Lily should be here somewhere. Lily there. So what I thought is because Lily is like the name for the French color test card for um, celluloid. Celluloid is obviously very analog. I should like. I cannot make analog Lily stock within the digital, so somehow we should be able to switch between times. So we just switched one desktop to the left, which is like a reference to the timeline, which I mean of course I'm making things way too complicated, but that's kinda of what I do, so it doesn't really matter. But then the lilies come and they start to explain who they are with analog feedback, which seems a bit cheesy, but that's just because people told me that I still like it. I don't know. This is like an example. And so I'm trying to build these different environments in which these different we say like, ghosts can talk and explain who they are and what they do. Um, this is kind of Silly, but here we have Ariana, and she can like make herself perfect. Do you guys know Perfect 365? It's like one of those beautifying apps, and the nice thing about the beautifying app is that you can make yourself only more white, because white is obviously. You can give yourself bigger eyes and make yourself whiter, um, which is with all beautifying apps. Like for instance, Huawei uh, telephones have the standard. You take a selfie, then you get blurry and wider. Your pimples get taken out. So I, I don't know. Like maybe it's still not right, but you do this process a lot, you become an alien. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. That's like that's just where I'm at. Soon it will be finished, and then I will probably have made a lot of mistakes. But um, hope. This is somehow making me think about templates in one perspective. Thank you, thank you for listening. can make it a bit fluent that we start with some um, questions and then we switch over um, to the drinks and to the more um, informal um, talking. So are there any like regions where we can have three, four questions now and then please. Uh, thank you very much for, for your wonderful presentation. I really liked it. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is a technical question. So uh, at the end of the, at the, the starting, uh, you mentioned about new compress new compression. How does it happen? Also, how, how how do you make it? And why is the process of new compression? What does it mean? And what is it? And this, my second question is that um, the uh, the glitched photo of you. But the, the result is that your face is very white and the, the, the background is very black. Can 
there are some uh, color points, but did you use as a starting point? Did you use a black and white photo, or did you um, how somehow manipulated it uh, so that your uh, face remains white? That's a very important question. Yeah. Um, let me try to find the original. Original. Here, this is it. So, yeah, I mean, it's, this is 2009, so also put it in context. 2009 is already 10 years ago. Uh, but the story of this is that, um, it's a long story. I'll try to make it really quick. I was with, I had a partner, we were supposed to do a performance together for the Danish National Television. He said something in the words of, you're not good enough. I was there alone, having to do this alone, but I was very sad because everything just fell down within like the, you know, it was very sad. I was very sad. Um, and I thought the only thing that I could do is write a letter, but not a real letter because that is really too much. So the video was, um, it was in terms of uh, the pulse signal, pulse like phase ultimate line signal, the old analog signal, it was cut. At that in that year in Denmark, so I was invited to make a reflection on the end of that signal, which for me was very like kind of clear that it had to be a metaphor for something else that was cut, specifically because we were living or we were sharing a time in Lund, which is like the opposite of the water in Sweden, so you could get the television signal there, so you would be able to get my letter, blah blah blah. So it was like a video to hit and I had made my face very white because I wanted to uh, make a that kind of like how do you say it was very naive I wanted to make a uh, a perfect face but then as you can see maybe a little bit my eyes are very black I was allergic to the makeup <laughs> so <laughs> I actually lost like the vision in my eyes for like the whole night I had to go to the hospital it was very painful. And then my friend came to pick me up and she was like, you know, if anybody knows, then you should know that you cannot try to be perfect. Everything is flawed. And then I thought, okay, I need to use this image for the Venegar file format. But that was, the truth is like, yeah, I am very white because I was like extra makeup and that's a black and white image. Yeah. So um, the other question, Sorry, my escape button fell off. Um, is about extra files, which is the compression tool, let's say, by Kim Asendorf. Uh, it's also known as new image file formats for artistic purposes. Digital artists and collectors deserve exclusive formats to personalize their files, including custom headers and comments. In extra file, every bit can be placed and compressed in the way an artist prefers it. So what? Um, Kim did basically is build a software which is called ExtraFile, which is a kind of an environment that supports you building a protocol to organize your data, your color channels, etc., in a particular way. But and then you can save it. So, for instance, as a Blinks or as a Bosky or whatever you want to save it as, that's like formats that he uh, or you yourself can develop within this program. So you can script it in the environment of the program. However, it will only open if you have the program installed because only that program can accept or understand those scripted behaviors of data. So it's it's an artwork, <laughs> you know, software art. Um, and then the way, because a lot of images, if you just compress them in another compression, they will look the same. It's just the data that is different. So the way to show this is by inviting rich artists to break the data. So you see that there's new compressions that give new organizations to the data that then comes to the surface. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it was a master thesis, so there's quite some documentation on that. It's interesting. Yeah. More questions? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask if it was your intention to find uh, these ghosts, to really find the people that were behind these uh, images, or it was more about uh, the how this image was used? 
sometimes yes. Like um, so, there's a few really interesting stories. Sometimes artists have done similar stuff. So then I have them here. Like for instance, the Render Ghosts. Those are like the stories of James Bridal trying to find his people, but he will never find them. Um, this one, Ayana, she has a name, I found her name. It's known because people like her photos and they started to get like obsessive and make Facebook groups about her. So and finally she came forward. Hannah also, because all, multiple people were interested. So um, I found those stories because I wanted to understand. But other people, like say this one or whatever, I cannot find her name. It's not possible. I don't know how. Uh, I mean, this one, her name might be something like Monica or something. I don't remember exactly. Something with an M. So there's some that have a name. And then there's this one, Carol, has a name. This one is really interesting. Back in the days in France, she was like the death mask that a lot of uh, French artists had on their wall to be artistic. But she has no name. It's called L'Inconnu. So I don't know. This one is also really interesting because she's like the woman that was like a young girl in New York. She was walking on the street and very pretty and then uh, a photographer came at her and was like, oh, you should be a model. And then she became a model for a lot of um, boost making people. So if you go to New York, you see a lot of boosts everywhere. There's just this one person and that's quite funny. This is this young girl that was like always modeling for the people that were so these stories are not just for image processing technologies, they are even for boosts and for image on the wall, death masks and whatever. Um, so this, this one has a name, but this one nobody knows, she is the unknown. Uh, this one's an interesting one because she is like the, the, the counter to Lena. Uh, there was a group of women that were completely sick and tired of Lena, so they made Fabio. So there, it is. it's it's not. I mean, I'm not the only one, but I think I have the biggest collection <laughs> <laughs> of ghosts. <laughs> Maybe not. Doesn't matter. I also <laughs> have to, oh, so sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I also remembered um, this. I don't really know what movie it was, but a movie where a guy fell in love with a woman. Yeah. Or where the, her she thought that her, her, his wife. Yeah. Exactly, was having an affair with a woman, and it was just like the placeholder uh, image in a picture. Ah, um, 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 yeah, yeah. Frame in the frame. I know her. Her was like, mm -hmm. was, and, and also Sam Wong. Sam Wong. Sam Sim Wong. Sim Wong. Remember this one movie? There's this artificial relationships. But I think it was just like a stupid rom com or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, Hollywood's <laughs> like yeah. choosing to use tropes that are not stupid, just like very boring, and then they need something also. Or it was I don't know. Yeah. But um, yeah, but uh, in the the pu uh, the ghosts that you know the names of, uh, have you tried to contact them? Personally? So there, yeah, that's an interesting question. So there's like with Lena, she was just interviewed by Wired actually, like. 40 years later, or something, so she's much older, she's no longer naked. <laughs> Put on some clothes. Um, and I was very jealous because I wish I had done that, but I didn't. Yes. No, it's done. Um, Jennifer, like, um, Constant has been trying to contact her, but he only gets angry, angry responses from the husband via the Guardian newspaper. <laughs> it's like a weird quote, you should follow, it's very funny. So, um, but I think that's about it. I have not tried myself. I could try with Hannah, but I know that Parker Ita tried to get a conversation with her brother, because he's the one who took the photo. Yeah. But that's again the guy, yeah. the, fact, the guy that took this photo. Because the women are just, they don't have, they still don't really have a voice. Like only men have got to say something. Yeah. But will you be able to systemize it? But will but I, I, I understood before that you don't want to lend them your voice as a sound, but like uh, uh, 
a voice of are there birds? Yeah, there, there will be birds. Of, like, where do they come from? Then Lena you know, will like, uh, just say who she is and okay. what's the, the the things that we know about her, not mm -hmm. how she feels about her mm -hmm. birds, because that's just I don't. You know, I can read the wire, but then I really implement mm -hmm. what somebody else researched. I think that's too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so see, here's the thing, like there's so many, if you really research a field, then you find so much information and you're not really sure how far you can go, what you can use, what you can, how you don't want to copy, but you can be inspired, and uh, it's very complicated. So, just trying to do the best. So then I will explain who she is. When, what, how, the, the, the knowledge that is clearly there without an opinion. And I think that's the best way not to impose a feeling because, yeah, that, so it would be a bit dry in a way, but I think it's okay to make it dry also. Yeah. Uh, comment slash a question like you never mentioned means. And it's almost the same phenomenon of That's faces true. that yeah. are all I'm not in any uh, country is the same face. And yeah. we don't know who these characters are in their life or their other. I've never actually really thought about that memes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but the thing is like now I also wanna take a little bit of distance maybe. <laughs> I need to finish it, but me no. memes can have like a button. That's <laughs> for the next researcher. <laughs> What's the meme? I'm sure if somebody has been doing research in some crying baby and some, I don't know, you know. Well, baby. that's all, like, all visual culture, but it's yeah. new, to recent. But I'm pretty sure yeah. there's someone out there questioning this phenomenon Thing. of putting words into. Actually, yeah, there is, a person there is quite a nice or interesting research on actually old right appropriation of uh, memes. And it's done by, on one hand, by um, Florian Kramer um, from the Netherlands. And on the other hand, uh, it's a, I think it's a, a woman from the Mm -hmm. The UK, I don't, don't remember. Ah, An An Angela, Na Angela Nagel. Nagel. Mm -hmm. She's from there. But she I don't know if it's about it's putting fine. words to a face that never said that. No. It's more just about alt right. Yes. Fascism. And how also a bit like where those means come from and where they first um, showed up and mm -hmm. how they can look up. God, also like, uh, how is it called, Baby, baby the Frog, um, yeah. and that's, that's also kind of like the same thing. This is research for Reddit, and I just have to go on Reddit, and I refuse <laughs> for now. <laughs> I know it's like, I should, but I cannot. There exists a site where uh, uh, people are putting the history of those memes together. Yeah, yeah. know your meme. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. But I don't know if they will say also, like, who's this meme? Yeah. And maybe they more describe what's the meme, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, what the content you can oh. give me. Yeah. And there is also a series on BuzzFeed, I think, where they talk of the people who are in the meme, like, in famous Really? Movies. Yeah, wow. interviews. That's interesting. Yeah, I think I see it's on one video and I think it's very interesting because he looks nothing like his me and I know that <gasps> it's like this uh, very popular with the man who just plays. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I will look this up, BuzzFeed meme history or something. Yeah, thank you. But actually it's also very interesting that, that, that because it, 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 it's coming again that, that, that let's say strategical um, focus on one hand on um, exposure and obfuscation on the other hand and uh, kind of, of finding the right um, technique or the technique for um, the procedure. That's Yes. Plenty of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all the time.